Welcome to the Hidden Heroes podcast. It's a collection of stories about tech pioneers who, over the past decades, laid the groundwork for the digital revolution. They, in a way, shaped the way we live, work, communicate, or travel. That's why, together with Stephen Johnson, who is the author of all the stories, we are on the mission to bring these pioneers into the spotlight and give them credit they truly deserve. In today's episode, we dive into the story of Philip Zimmerman, the inventor of pretty good privacy, the most widely used email encryption software in the world. He almost went to jail so that he could send an email without worrying that your personal data would be stolen. Brought to you by NetGuru. The Crypto Wars. How Philip Zimmerman fought for our right to privacy. Three decades ago, Phil Zimmerman almost went to jail so that you could send an email without worrying that your personal data would be stolen. On June 5th, 1991, a puzzling announcement appeared on an online network of political activists known as PeaceNet. The announcement was a kind of paradox, a public message that contained instructions for keeping other messages secret. A few hours later, the same note appeared in one of the news groups of the global bulletin board Usenet. The message volunteered a new standard for encrypting data based on a scheme known as public key encryption that had, up to that point, mostly been deployed by giant corporations or government agencies. This new standard was designed for the rest of us, and its creator, an anti-nuclear activist and programmer named Phil Zimmerman, was offering it up to the world for free. Zimmerman had given it a memorable, if somewhat unassuming name, play on a grocery store called Ralph's Pretty Good Groceries, featured in one of his favorite public radio shows, A Prairie Home Companion. He called it Pretty Good Privacy, or PGP for short. But then matters took a surprising turn. Zimmerman's actions would spark one of the most contentious political fights of early internet culture, leading to groundbreaking legal decisions that still shape the way we communicate more than 30 years later. Zimmerman would soon find himself the subject of a federal investigation, facing potential jail time. And the most unlikely twist of all was this. The FBI was accusing this longtime peace activist of being an illicit arms dealer. The practice of encoding information so that it can be shared privately is almost as old as writing itself. Around 4,000 years ago, Egyptian monks developed a system of non-standard hieroglyphics to conceal their messages from prying eyes. At the height of the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar deployed what is now called a substitution cipher to send commands to military officers on the front line, swapping letters in each message according to an agreed-upon pattern. Codes and code-breaking played a central role in the invention of modern computers, most famously in the cracking of the German Enigma code overseen by Alan Turing during World War II. Until the rise of the Internet era, Complex encryption schemes were mostly the province of spy agencies, military institutions, and corporations that had trade secrets they needed to protect, not to mention the occasional crime syndicate or terrorist organization. Most ordinary people had no need for intricate ciphers in their lives, because privacy was already an abundant resource. As Zimmerman explained in one of his initial notes introducing PGP, quote, When the United States Constitution was framed, the Founding Fathers saw no need to explicitly spell out the right to a private conversation. That would have been silly. 200 years ago, all conversations were private. If if someone else was within earshot, you could just go out behind the barn and have your conversation there. The right to a private conversation was a natural right, not just in a philosophical sense, but in a law of physics sense, given the technology of the time. All that began to change in the 1980s with the rise of the first mainstream computer networks, first connecting offices and academic institutions and government agencies. While Zimmerman had graduated from college around that time with a degree in computer science, he found himself exploring these new online spaces thanks to his political engagements. He had settled in Boulder, Colorado, working a day job as a software engineer but moonlighting as a policy analyst for an organization known as the Nuclear Weapons Freeze Campaign. The world was a different place back then, he recalled many years later. Reagan was in the White House, Brezhnev was in the Kremlin, 
FEMA was telling cities to prepare evacuation plans, and millions of people feared the world was drifting inexorably towards nuclear war. Before long, he became an active participant in the anti-nukes protest movement that reached its heyday in the mid-80s. He was arrested at a famous Nevada protest during that period, alongside the astronomer Carl Sagan and the actors Martin Sheen, Chris Christopherson, and Robert Blake. Through his political work, which was by definition global in scope, he came to recognize that activists were going to need a new kind of support. I wanted to do something with privacy tools back in the 80s, and I felt like peace activists needed protection from the White House and other government agencies. But his day job commitments and his anti-nuke activism kept him from pursuing the idea. I just didn't have the time, he says now. During the 1980s, tools like email or the wider internet were not yet on the radar screen of the average person, even in high-tech societies like the United States. But to the individuals who had dabbled in the technology, it was increasingly clear that society was on the verge of a momentous transition from the world of top-down mass media to online networks. And those networks were going to change the balance of power where privacy was concerned in fundamental ways. If most of our communications and much of our commerce were going to travel over digital channels, that would open up whole new possibilities for governments to eavesdrop on our conversations or cyber criminals to steal personal information like social security numbers or bank routing information. Until recently, Zimmerman explained back in the early 90s, if the government wanted to violate the privacy of ordinary citizens, they had to expend a certain amount of expense and labor to intercept and steam open and read paper mail. This kind of labor-intensive monitoring was not practical on a large scale. This is like catching one fish at a time with a hook and line. Today, email can be routinely and automatically scanned for interesting keywords on a vast scale without detection. This is like drift net fishing. The days of securing your privacy by heading out behind the barn to have a chat were over, Zimmerman realized. Ordinary people were going to need access to encryption. And the timing was fortuitous. The processing power of ordinary PCs had improved enough to make powerful encryption available to people who didn't have access to mainframes. But even more importantly, a handful of brilliant mathematicians had recently solved a problem that had bedeviled codemakers for centuries. Not the problem of designing clever ciphers, but rather the problem of sharing the keys that allowed recipients to decipher them. You can think of the relationship between ciphers and keys as being the equivalent of a film first played forwards and then in reverse. A cipher transforms an intelligible message into an unintelligible one, and a key returns the message to its original state. However much mathematical ingenuity you put into inventing your cipher, making it impossible for any potential eavesdroppers to crack, if your intended recipient doesn't have the key, the message will be noise to them, a jumble of letters or zeros and ones, utterly meaningless. This is why the problem of figuring out how to share the key, technically known as the key distribution problem, is a significant part of the art and science of cryptography. If you can just meet your recipient behind the barn and whisper the key to them, you're fine. But these kinds of in-person approaches don't work if you're dealing with ciphers, like all modern digital encryption formats, that involve complex mathematical functions that can't be conveyed in a private conversation. It also doesn't work well if you want to change the cipher at regular intervals to confound would-be codebreakers. During World War II, the Germans struggled mightily, distributing the daily changes to the Enigma key to all of its communication operators, including the ones submerged on U-boats, all of which meant that for most of the history of cryptography, your code was only as secure as your key distribution plan was. All of that changed in the 1970s with the invention of public key cryptography. The core breakthrough behind the public key approach lay in the idea of splitting the key into two parts, a public key and a private key. A public key allows the sender to encrypt the message in such a way that it can only be deciphered by the recipient's private key. That means that public keys can be openly available for anyone to see and use without worrying about compromising the privacy of the communication. 
The best way to imagine how public key cryptography works, without getting into the complex mathematics of it, which involves one-way functions and factoring large prime numbers, is to use a metaphor from Simon Singh's first-rate history of encryption, the code book. Imagine you want to send a package to your friend Emily and guarantee that only she can open it. In this system, Emily has a special padlock designed with a private key that only she has access to. She distributes copies of the padlock to post offices all over the world. When you want to ship your secret box to your friend, you simply go to the post office and request an Emily padlock and use it to secure the box. Once you click the padlock shut, anyone who intercepts a passage will be unable to open it. Even you, the sender, can't get access to the contents. But when the package arrives on Emily's doorstep, she can open it instantly with her private key. By the time Phil Zimmerman started tinkering with encryption software in the early 90s, a number of public key standards had been developed by security firms, including a patented system called RSA, developed by the MIT scientist who'd initially helped invent the public key approach back in the 70s. If you were a large corporation or a government agency who could afford to license these privacy tools, robust encryption was readily available to you. But an ordinary user just trying to send an email without worrying about someone snooping on them was mostly out of luck. For a stretch of time, Zimmerman's work on what would become PGP was more of a hobby than a central pursuit. But then, in January of 1991, then-Senator Joe Biden co-sponsored a bill known as the Comprehensive Counterterrorism Act that included a clause that triggered alarm bells in Zimmerman's mind and in the minds of other privacy advocates around the country. Quote, It is the sense of Congress that providers of electronic communication services and manufacturers of electronic communication service equipment shall ensure that communication systems permit the government to obtain the plain text contents of voice, data, and other communications when appropriately authorized by law. The proposed bill made it clear that Congress was getting ready to mandate that all encryption schemes include a backdoor where government agencies could get access to the data if a judge signed off on the surveillance request. Zimmerman realized that he was now racing against the clock. It was a hard road to get to the release of PGP, he later recalled. I missed five mortgage payments developing the software in the first half of 1991. But by June, he had the code in working order, including some clever tweaks to the approach to make it usable on ordinary home computers. Given his long history in the anti-nukes movement, PeaceNet was a fitting platform to debut his software. Zimmerman made a modest but ultimately ineffective attempt to limit the spread of the encryption to the United States a decision that would later prove critical in his legal battles. The version uploaded to Usenet by a friend contained the tag US only. Zimmerman later confessed that he was confused about the way that Usenet handled geographic limitations. In 1991, he later explained, I did not yet know enough about Usenet newsgroups to realize that a US only tag was merely an advisory tag that had little real effect on how Usenet propagated newsgroup postings. I thought it actually controlled how Usenet routed the posting. They were just two seemingly insignificant posts, tossed out into a vast sea of digital information, one on PeaceNet and one on Usenet. But the gesture was a decisive one nonetheless. PGP now belonged to the world. For the first year or so after the release, Zimmerman's gambit seemed to have paid off. PGP began quietly circulating around the globe in the still fringe community of cyber activists. In late 1991, someone in Latvia sent Zimmerman an email, typical of many he received during this period, that said, quote, Phil, I wish you to know, let it never be, but if dictatorship takes over Russia, your PGP is widespread from Baltic to Far East now and will help democratic people if necessary. Thanks. The anti-terrorism bill that had prodded Zimmerman to release the software so quickly never actually became law, in part because of protests from civil liberties groups who argued that the surveillance it would enable was Orwellian in its scope. But Zimmerman's public release of PGP was ultimately threatened by the long history of encryption being used in military affairs. On a legal level, strong encryption was considered to be the equivalent of munitions, 
given the prominent role it had played in conflicts like World War II. And the United States had laws on the books that prevented arms dealers from exporting weapons to foreign countries without a special license from the State Department. Traditionally, those restrictions targeted machine guns or or fighter jet manufacturers who were selling their physical goods to Saudi Arabia or Brazil. But if the legal definition of munitions included encryption software as well, then, technically speaking, there was a case that it should also apply to a coder uploading data to the internet for anyone in the world to use. In February of 1993, Zimmerman got a call from two federal agents. Quote, they said they wanted to talk about PGP, he recalls now. I just assumed they needed some advice. Maybe they'd encountered it somewhere and just wanted to ask some questions. But then they said they wanted to visit me in Boulder, even though they were located in San Jose in California. And I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like they're just looking for advice. Zimmerman hired a criminal lawyer named Phil Dubois, who arranged to have the agents conduct their interview in his office. Within a matter of months, a grand jury in California had been assembled, gathering evidence on whether Zimmerman had violated weapons export law. A successful prosecution could have put Zimmerman in jail for up to five years, accompanied by fines of up to a million dollars. Asked now if the federal scrutiny was stressful, Zimmerman lets out a rueful laugh. Oh, yes, he says. I had family and small children. I needed to protect them. Who was going to pay the mortgage if I was in prison? It was a pretty miserable experience. Many years later, after the statute of limitations on the alleged crime had expired, Zimmerman confessed, My defense lawyers wouldn't let me tell people that it was a human rights project, because that would have been tantamount to admitting that I wanted it to be exported since most of the human rights problems were overseas. But his lawyer's advice and the looming pressure of the federal investigation did not deter Zimmerman from spreading the gospel of PGP. He was detained by customs agents at Dulles Airport after returning from a trip to Hungary and Romania. I don't have to explain to Eastern Europeans why it is important for the government not to get too powerful, he told Wired magazine at the time. Zimmerman's bags were searched twice and he was warned to expect similar treatment each time he attempted to return to the United States. Zimmerman's clash with the feds became one of the defining skirmishes in the crypto wars of the early 1990s, drawing attention to the importance of strong encryption and the dangers of giving governments backdoor access to enormous private communication channels. In part, these battles had been prompted by the courageous acts of digital resistance undertaken by software activists like Phil Zimmerman. But they were also set in motion by a series of increasingly ambitious surveillance plans enacted by the U.S. government. After the passing of a 1994 bill that forced phone companies to install automated wiretapping architecture in their digital networks, the FBI announced plans to ramp up its wiretapping capacity, to enable it to monitor up to 1% of all phone calls, a massive increase compared to what it had been previously been able to monitor using manual alligator clips on phone lines. All these developments slowly turned popular opinion towards the side of the crypto advocates. MIT came to Zimmerman's defense by publishing a 600-page book that included the PGP code, which meant that if Phil Zimmerman was an illegal arms dealer, then so was one of America's most prestigious universities. The newly formed Electronic Frontier Foundation took on the case of another embattled cryptographer, leading to a landmark 1995 decision that declared that software code was a form of speech and thus protected under the First Amendment. In 1996, the feds announced that they were no longer pursuing a criminal indictment for the international release of PGP. After a strange, unwanted interlude as a rogue arms dealer, Bill Zimmerman went back to being what he had been all along, a programmer and civil liberties activist. Zimmerman's heroic stand and the legal arguments put forth by the EFF inspired a whole new generation of thinkers and software designers who recognized from the beginning that they were inevitably political consequences to the software we use. Quote, The crypto wars made a big impression on me, says science fiction author and longtime EFF board member Cory Doctorow. 
I was a larvum when Zimmerman released his code, but it did do something to radicalize me. And EFF's code is speech, legal victory, is one of my pole stars. PGP was later codified into a new standard known as Open PGP, overseen by a working task force like many of the other open shared protocols that provide the foundation for all of our online communications today. It remains the most popular method of encrypting email. Thanks to the widespread adoption of other forms of encryption, secure commerce has flourished on the internet. And despite the FBI's worries about sinister networks deploying Zimmerman's tools to evade law enforcement, global terrorism has declined. When journalists began sifting through the trove of data released publicly by Edward Snowden in 2012, documenting the vast extent of the NSA's surveillance of private communication, they discovered one telling limitation in the leaked documents. Countless intercepted messages that were left undeciphered, with only the note, no decrypt available for this PGP encrypted message. More than two decades after Phil Zimmerman uploaded his initial message to PeaceNet, the most powerful spy agency in the world still couldn't crack his code. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to our podcast so you won't miss the next Hidden Hero story. And to learn more about the Hidden Heroes publishing initiative by NetGuru, visit hiddenheroes.netguru.com. Until the next time.